I moved a college baseball team up to the MLB, and today I have five seasons to win them a World Series. Tennessee won the College World Series, so they're the team I'm using, but even with their success in the SEC, they do not stand a chance in Major League Baseball, and as you can see, this roster has a long way to go. Since we're using a college, I'm only going to be drafting college players in this video, and to add some extra challenge, our player salaries can never exceed $60 million. That number makes our budget very similar to the Oakland Athletics, which means we're going to have to be very selective about the players we add throughout the rebuild. We only have a few guys with decent potential to build our team around, but right after that, our roster really falls off a cliff. So honestly, before we can do anything, we need to get through season number one because there's no way this current roster is accomplishing anything. To open the year, we got swept by Los Angeles, and for some reason, the roster that I downloaded replaced the Orioles, who are a very good team. So we have the number 22nd pick, which means guys like Mike Copeland and Brian Maldonado are not gonna be options. That definitely caught me off guard, but on the bright side, we do have two first round picks. And in our first week of scouting, I found a pretty solid player in Trevor Wood. The one good thing about forcing myself to take college players is at least we're gonna get some pretty high floor guys because looking at our record, we're definitely gonna need them. There's at least a couple positives at the end of our first month, but overall, this is terrible. And while our rotation is also miserable, we have one guy playing pretty well right now, which is definitely a win. My expectations for this team are so low that I'll literally take anything good that comes out of season number one. And because we're so bad, Bad, I'm definitely willing to sacrifice some potential of our draft picks to get some guys who can play right now. However, the best case scenario is to find someone who can play immediately and also has pretty good potential, and Trevor Wood seems to be our best chance to find this type of player, so he's going to be our first pick. Then for my next pick, I wanted to take Will Ju, who has high potential and good contact, but of course he got scooped up two selections later. This definitely puts me in a pretty weird spot, but another high potential option has caught my eye in Javier Castilla, because look at that potential range. He is my next selection. Our Discovery Scouts did a very good job of finding pitchers, so some of these guys should be available later. So I'm going to shift my focus back to offense, where our next best player is Ernest Rubio. Now once again in round three, I'm taking the best position player available, and that's going to be catcher Jason Gonzalez, who has pretty good contact. And then we followed up with one of our last options in Marco Gomez Phelps. Now with our last two picks, just like we hoped, there are some starting pitchers available. So we're going to close the door on a very productive draft. We are 15 and 82 at the break, so this will be a very fast season. And checking out our stats, I'm looking for any reason to be optimistic, but I'm just not finding any silver lining. That being said, we have nothing to sell at the trade deadline, which is definitely unfortunate because there's a couple guys on this list who could really help us out. So all we can do is sim through the trade deadline and check out our draft picks as Trevor Wood came in at 71 overall with 79 potential. And then with our second first rounder, we got Javier Castilla, who's coming in with 94 potential. Then after him, Ernest Rubio and Jason Gonzalez definitely aren't the most flashy picks in the world, but I'm definitely glad their potentials are both above 70 and they have decent contact skills. However, speaking of decent contact, maybe the best hitter we got is Marco Gomez Phelps, who's coming in at 59 overall, but that rating is definitely weighed down by his fielding and power, which kind of sucks for a first baseman, but I can't really complain. Then as you always see in MLB The Show, both of our discovery pitchers are pretty good, so overall this has been a great draft. The rest of the season's gonna go about as bad as we expected, as the Volunteers finished with only 28 wins. And now in the offseason, we're facing the huge challenge of trying to build this team without spending a lot of money, so I decided to put out a lot of lowball offers and just hope that a few of them get accepted. Then there were a couple other players like Brent Rooker and Zach Little who did not get offered arbitration, so we were able to improve our team pretty considerably, but the most important part of the offseason is the draft lottery. We cannot afford to bounce out of the top three, but thankfully we're going to hold on to the number one spot. So in just one offseason, it really feels like we're set up much better for the future. And I'm very curious how this team performs in its first game. I am very thankful we're starting the season off against the Oakland Athletics. And in his very first at bat, our first round pick, Trevor Wood, has a double. I really hope that's a sign of good things to come for the rookie. And now our veteran addition, Jock Peterson, is going to score him. So the Volunteers already lead one to nothing. And I know it's not very impressive doing this against Oakland. But my goal is to simply not be the worst team in baseball. As another free agent signing, Ahmed Rosario drives a two-run shot over the wall. At the end of the fifth, we still have a shutout going, but now in the top of the ninth, we have a two-run lead that we're looking to extend as former athletic Brent Rookers going the other way for a double. I cannot believe the A's let him hit free agency, but it would be very fitting if he became the final run of this game as Blake Burke collected his third hit of the day. Burke is one of the most promising players from the original roster, as he's one of our very rare players with B potential and he won Rookie of the Year. He might have delivered the final run of a big win, but our catcher, Cal 
Cal Stark has different ideas, as we didn't just win that game, but also swept the series. Tennessee is undefeated after four games, but now they're in a new series against the Angels, where they lead by one run, but make it more as Jock Peterson goes yard. Tennessee secured a 5-0 start, but of course, they couldn't stay undefeated forever, and now they have a huge challenge against the Astros. We are tied up in the ninth, so we are more than likely going to extra innings unless they walk it off, and Diaz lifts this one deep into right field, being chased down, and it drops in for a double. I'm definitely nervous facing Kyle Tucker, and since we walked him, we're facing Alex Bregman, who's unable to end the game. We have been in a lot of close games so far this year, and unfortunately, we just hit a line drive, followed by a grounder straight to first base, so Houston has another chance to walk this off, and this time, they're not going to miss the opportunity, as Jose Altuve ends it on a sacrifice fly. That was a tough game to lose, but on the bright side, we're still off to a very good start, and we have the number one overall pick, and at least at first glance, Alejandro Campos looks like an absolute beast. We're looking to rebound after losing our first series of the season against the Astros, but now we're tied against Toronto, and ever since that Astros series, our offense has definitely struggled in late game situations, so it's very encouraging. We have two guys on, and now the bases are loaded. Here's a big opportunity for Mauricio Dubon, who unfortunately does the worst thing possible, so our offense fails to deliver again, but fortunately for the Volunteers, it looks like their bullpen is going to give them one more chance. Walking this one off would win us a three-game series, but our chances of doing this don't look very encouraging as we're down to our last out, so we really need a clutch play from Ahmed Rosario, but that was not a good pitch to swing at. Then right after that, Toronto's offense woke up with three runs, so it really feels like Tennessee is plummeting back down to earth after a hot start, and at least we scored. Maybe there's a chance we can rally just like Toronto did, but the only problem is that Dubon is up to bat, and as you can see, he does not do well against righties, and there's no more pinch hit options. We can not afford to take any chances here, and staying patient pays off as he draws a walk. So now the bases are loaded for our catcher, and he gets a good pitch to hit, but unfortunately, he grounds out, and we lose our second straight series. To make things even worse, though, we finish scouting Alejandro Campos, and he is not the player I thought he would be, and honestly, this may be a problem because right after him, all the players that I like are 18 years old. To make things even worse, we dropped out of first place, and now we're in extras against a very beatable team. Another loss would send us back down to 500, but Sheets gets runners at the corners, so all we need is a sack fly to win it, but there's a strikeout, which brings up Dubon with two outs who cannot deliver. This team is not clutch at all, and just like we saw against Toronto, our bullpen could not hold on. It's very embarrassing, but the White Sox just swept us, so we've officially lost eight out of our last ten, and until things start looking better, I'm turning my attention to scouting, where we just found Andres Rivera, who definitely doesn't have good potential, but he could play for us right away. I'm hoping we have better luck with first baseman Robbie Ramirez, because even though our offense has done better this season, it's very clear we still need a few more impact bats. On the bright side, though, it's definitely encouraging to see some really good numbers coming out of our rotation, as the Volunteers currently rank 13th in Team ERA. After a week of scouting him, it does look like Robbie Ramirez could be that guy coming in with very good power, and that's definitely a relief, because as you can see, most of our other options are 18 years old. At the start of May, we are two games below 500, so we really need this series against the Royals to be a good one, and here's an RBI. So we're already leading 2 to nothing in the third inning, and Ahmed Rosario goes the other way to drive in two more. It's definitely encouraging to see us start fast, but here come the Royals, who just rallied to make this a one-run game as Jock Peterson goes deep to right field, watching it go and drifting foul. That would have been an incredible answer, but at least Brent Rooker is going to add an insurance run, and I'm definitely glad he did because Kansas City tied it up. Tennessee started their day with a 4 nothing lead, but two really good innings from Kansas City have negated that, and now in the ninth, we have runners at the corners, but Rooker cannot score them, so now Kansas City can walk it off. We have already lost way too many close games this season, so I'm glad we're going to turn a double play. So once again, we're back in extra innings, and lucky for us, they hit our batter, so we have two guys aboard, and one of them is going to score. That was another big moment for Ahmed Rosario, who seems to have a lot of them, and Christian Arroyo was just so close to keeping that one fair. There is no doubt that would have scored two runs, as Cal Stark is able to load the bases. So here's a huge chance for first-round pick Trevor Wood, who flies out on the first pitch he saw. We have stranded runners on base all day, and that is definitely the reason Kansas City got back in this game, but here's a deep fly out into right field, and thankfully this one's over. We finally won a close game, so once again, we have a bit of momentum, as we're two games back in the division. However, this is a very tough matchup against against the Phillies, as they won two games, and we definitely can't afford to get swept, but we're down one in the eighth inning. Unfortunately, though, Philadelphia crushed us with four home runs in the ninth, so Tennessee continues to be baseball's streakiest team. It feels like no matter how many games they win or lose, 
they stay at 500. So this year we've literally been the definition of mediocre, but you gotta remember that we only won 28 games in season number one, so I will definitely take this improvement. We swept Washington the last time we played them, so I'm hoping this series against them can help us get back above 500, but unfortunately it's not going very well. We're trailing by one in the bottom of the ninth, so this is our last chance, as there are two outs for Trevor Wood, who unfortunately pops it up, and this team cannot decide what it wants to be. I guess this makes a lot of sense, because while we have a lot of players like Mauricio Dubon, Christian Arroyo, and Ahmed Rosario who are playing pretty well, there are several other signings that have been pretty disappointing, and even though our rotation started out pretty decent, they're nothing special. Staying on our brand of mediocrity, our batting average is ranked 17th in the league, and right now our team batting average is smack dab in the middle. Up until this rebuild, I really underestimated how many players in the draft are 18, and honestly, that's really limited my options, but has also added a very fun challenge for me. One winning or losing streak is probably all this team needs to determine its direction for the rest of the year, because much like myself at most things in real life, we've been very consistently mediocre, and honestly, if my job wasn't to sit here and tell stories about fake baseball games, I don't know what I'd be doing in this real world, so if you do enjoy my content and want to see more, please drop a like and subscribe. We are once again in extra innings, but our bullpen just held strong, so we have a very good chance to win this one, as Wood slaps this up the middle, and the rookie scores the walk-off run. Now all we can do is hope that this leads to more success, but we just lost a series, so we're still in third place for the East. The Volunteers' next opponents are the Rays, Dodgers, and Braves, and we're starting the gauntlet with a ninth inning tie. There are two outs, so we're trying to give ourselves a walk-off chance, but Jose Caballero has different ideas, absolutely blasting this into left field for a three-run shot. It's always the former Mariners that do me dirty, and I'm convinced it's a curse because they were not swinging their stick like that with Seattle, and come on, you've got to be kidding me. Obviously, we didn't walk that one off, and then after that, the Rays did sweep the series, which was followed up by three more losses to LA. We only took one game of that entire gauntlet, so in just one week, we've fallen into last place. This is a great time to get into the MLB draft, where I honestly feel like I only have one true option with the number one overall pick, and that is first baseman Robbie Ramirez, who definitely needs to work on his contact skills, but the power is undeniable. We're gonna take him. Then in the second round, my favorite option is starting pitcher Phil Bermudez, and after simming to our selection, a lot of my favorite targets did go off the board, but as you can see, Bermudez is still there, and I'm taking him. My options are really so limited that I didn't even make a draft queue, which is honestly kind of nice, and now in round three, I'm going with the best player available, and that is center fielder Josh Temple. There are two discovery pitchers I'm hoping fall later in the draft, so I'm taking another position player, Garrett Eldridge, who could have decent potential, and as you can see in round five, as they always do in MLB The Show, my discovery guys are still there. However, I'm not going to take either of them right now, because there's a player at a much bigger position of need, and that is Art Carter, who's not just a good closer, but he's guaranteed to have good potential. After drafting three starting pitchers last season, I could not risk a closer going off the board, and that risk paid off because Chris Mateo and Jesus Pina are still here, and honestly, Mateo's high potential is very tempting, but remember that this is a very short rebuild, so he may never see the field for us. I'm taking Pina. Once again, I'm feeling pretty confident about our draft, and I feel like it can only supplement a team that's already improved so much, as we're 43 and 53 at the break, and I'm really hoping we can get off to a fresh start in the second half of the season, because as you can see, a lot of our guys are on cold streaks. As you could probably guess though, we only had one all-star, and that's gonna be Ahmed Rosario, so we need some more players to step up if we're gonna turn our season around, and that starts with young guys like Trevor Wood, who just got the go-ahead RBI robbed away from him. Instead, this game's still tied at least until Jonathan India goes yard, and unfortunately for Tennessee, they are very used to being in this type of situation, because losses in close games have been by far their biggest weakness. The trade deadline is here, and unlike last season where we really had nothing to move, I do feel like we have a few valuable chips, and just because he's available, the one guy who really has my attention is O'Neal Cruz. In this universe, he was traded to the Cardinals, who signed Willie Adamas, so they're really trying to cash in on him as much as they can, so I'm gonna send two pitching prospects, along with a 19-year-old 70 overall center fielder. That is gonna get the deal done for one of the most exciting players in baseball. To no one's surprise, he immediately becomes our best player, but there's one more player on the block I want to make a move for, and that is Bryce Elder, and because we just signed Cruz, I'm gonna send them a B potential shortstop. Now the third and final move I'm making is for Alex Karilhoff, who's definitely expendable for Minnesota because they just signed Pete Alonso. I really hope these moves can push us into the wild card, but before we can play out the rest of our season, we need to see our most recent draft. I felt pretty good about this one, and entering, that is a lot of green, no blue, but that is okay, because at least 
least I'm seeing a lot of consistency and some high overall guys that could maybe push for a spot on the team right away. For this challenge, this was probably the worst season to have the number one overall pick because Ramirez was the only guy I felt comfortable taking and he's honestly kind of disappointing. However, looking at some other drafts, the grass was not greener on the other side because our second best option, Alejandro Campos, only has 73 potential. There is not a single player above 18 years old I would have rather drafted as Andres Rivera is also 72 potential. Somehow, this was the best number one pick we could have made, but now that I'm looking at it, Phil Bermudez would have been just as good of an option and we got him in the second round. Then in round three, we took a well-rounded center fielder in Josh Temple before deciding to take a high overall infielder in round four and that was a great decision as Garrett Eldridge has 85 potential and he can make good contact. Then we ended with a closing pitcher in Art Carter who honestly has a lower potential and overall than I was expecting. But regardless, he's a pretty good prospect for our system along with Jesus Pena. We are definitely improving but now we have a huge test against the division leading Rays and a sacrifice fly just tied the game so now we really need our bullpen to step up which very clearly is not going to happen and there was no way we were coming back from that. Unfortunately, even after making those moves, we're not really playing much better as a rough month of August puts us back in last. We have definitely taken a step back in the second half even after making a move for O'Neill Cruz and I decided to simulate the rest of the year because it was very clear we were not making the playoffs. 74 wins is still great improvement over 28 but overall I'm pretty disappointed because O'Neill Cruz, Bryce Elder, and Alex Kirilhoff should have gotten us a bit closer to the playoffs. Cruz did have a very good season with 114 RBIs along with a 980 OPS and one-time all-star Bryce Elder also showed he could be a reliable starter. Going into free agency, we are about $18 million short of 60, which is definitely good news because if we play our cards right and maybe get a bit lucky, we could come away with a pretty solid free agent. This time last season, we were coming off of a 28-win campaign, so it was all about quantity over quality, but this time around, I really want to acquire some players that can get us to the playoffs, starting with Dominic Fletcher. And if you remember when I made the O'Neill Cruz trade, I said that I was devastated I traded Jesus Pena, but apparently I didn't and he's still on the team, so I definitely just got him confused with somebody else. That's kind of funny, but now just to honor the meme, I feel like I have to move him and we're going to get Matt Manning in return. After offering deals to all of our players, money is a little tighter than I expected, so we're going to have to get a little creative with these contracts as I'm starting the offseason only making these two moves. That definitely used up most of our budget, but I'm definitely glad that we were able to secure a solid number one pitcher. But our last move of the offseason was also pretty significant as Boston did not offer arbitration to Tanner Hoke, and obviously I was going to swoop right in. Trading for guys like Dominic Fletcher and Matt Manning definitely kept our payroll down as we're entering season three with $5 million to spare. I truly believe this is a playoff team and that all starts with O'Neill Cruz, but if we want to make a run at the postseason, he's going to need some more help. It doesn't help that our new ace gave up a home run to his first batter, and this game would only get worse for Tennessee, who trailed by three runs, but thankfully O'Neill Cruz comes through with a two RBI double. So far, he has all three of our runs, but now in the top of the eighth, we have finally tied the game, and our bullpen definitely deserves a ton of credit for holding it down, because outside of a great performance from O'Neill Cruz, our offense has been very lackluster today. No one should be surprised that the first game of this season has gone to extras, and finally in the 11th, we take the lead. And even though it was a very weak grounder, it got the job done, but now instead of winning this game, Seattle's gonna hit us with a grounder of their own. Scoring one run was already difficult enough, but thankfully it didn't take long for us to score another one as Trevor Wood gives us the lead. So now we get a second chance that we cannot pass up, but you've got to be kidding me. Just like they mirrored the grounder, they're going to send a blooper into left field to tie it. It literally feels like we're playing ourselves in a game of chess that never ends, but at least with the extended game, Cruz picked up RBI number four and Tennessee finally ended Seattle. So far, our season is off to a very good start, but we have to keep our foot on the gas to avoid another collapse as we're in another close game against the Chicago Cubs. Thankfully, we are leading by one run in the top of the seventh, and Trevor Wood continues a 12-game hit streak here and gives O'Neill Cruz another RBI chance, but instead, he's gonna load the bases. There are two outs for Alex Kirilhoff, who's gonna slap this the other way and deliver a two-run single, and that is the exact type of play we were missing from last season, but hold the phone, Blake Burke is launching an absolute nuke. We have not seen a lot of power this season, so that is a huge relief, and this ended up being a huge win. Right now, we have a three-game lead in the East, and for that, you can give credit to the second best rotation in baseball. Bryce Elder has a shutout going against our division rivals, the Rays, at least until Josh Lowe smokes this up the middle to tie the game. I guess he's used to taking on Tampa Bay as a former member of the Rays, but unfortunately, I really should have
pulled him because he just gave up the go ahead run. Now we need a ninth inning rally thanks to my questionable management skills, but there is a man on second for Blake Burke, but unfortunately I panicked and popped this up deep into right field as we lost a tough one to our division rival. Losing this series could cost us our division lead, but instead we shook it off and won the last three games of the series, which extended our lead to four and a half games. After a month, it really feels like our offense is average at best, aside from O'Neill Cruz, who's having an electric start. So as I mentioned before, our rotation is a massive reason we're as good as we are, because if we scroll down, our team batting average is literally right in the middle at 15th. I am all in for the playoffs this year, and I'm even willing to move on from the number one overall pick to acquire a very good catcher. But of course, Ramirez won't get the deal done on his own, so I have to throw in our third rounder, Josh Temple. It's a lot to give up, but I feel like Mike Copeland's gonna be very worth it, and we're already counting on him in our most important series of the year as he goes the other way, and this blooper's gonna drop for a single. We are down one to the Dodgers, and these hits are not pretty, but at least they're getting the job done, as our challenge now is to score these runners without grounding into a double play, and Rooker does exactly that. Now there's even more pressure to score the runner, but we strike out, so we're officially in trouble, as there's one out, but Rodolfo Castro grounds into a game-ending double play. We got shut out by a team we could see again in the playoffs, but with a seven-game division lead, I'm not panicking just yet. Our offense is definitely improving slowly but surely, as a lot of young players continue to take strides. And by the way, I did not show this, but we have a new pitcher in AJ Puck from the rebuilding Marlins. And as you can see, since he's in a contract year, it did not take much to get him. Hopefully that move helps us avoid a collapse, because if you remember last year, we were in a very good spot and then blew it in the second half. We definitely need to win more close games against good teams as we're facing Arizona. And with one out in the 11th, the winning run is on third base. And here's a sacrifice fly from Jake Bowers to secure us the close victory. Because we're in season three of the rebuild, I've had scouting on auto this entire season. But maybe it's time to at least look at this draft class, especially because we have the number one overall pick, which I did not even notice. Obviously, we have O'Neill Cruz on the team, but he could always play third base for us. And if we're unable to win the World Series next season, maybe that shortstop could get us over the hump. We have the best record in baseball, so it seems we're on our way to great things. As we're looking for redemption against the Rays, who beat us in heartbreaking fashion, but our third baseman, Christian Moore, just went yard. He must have heard me talking about replacing him, because that was a huge play, because those were our first runs of the game, and that made all the difference against Tampa Bay. However, as I'm sitting here, I just realized that I can't even take Trevor Tunick if I want to, as because it's a new recording day, I completely forgot that I cannot draft 18-year-olds. That is so freaking painful, dude. I was so excited about taking a generational player that I forgot all about the only rule of the rebuild, and honestly, it might be cringe, but I'm considering this closer at number one because we could really use him. It's definitely between him and this starting pitcher, but we honestly don't know much about him, so I'm doing something I have never done before, and that is taking a closer at number one overall. Now I get to watch the Reds, who already have a 99 potential shortstop in Ellie De La Cruz, take another one, but at least we're going into the All-Star break at 72 and 26. It is no surprise we've had this much success, as nearly our entire team is on a hot streak right now, and because we have six players with an OPS over 800, it's very clear our offense has taken the next step, and that's not even mentioning the dominance of our starting pitching, as our top five guys all have ERAs under three. We're currently fourth in batting average and fourth in runs, but in terms of team ERA, there's nobody that even comes close to us. However, we're about to get even better because I'm making this trade for Spencer Steer, and that move puts us $1 million under budget. We're in a very close division game against the Red Sox coming out of the break, but we do have the lead thanks to three RBIs from the top of our lineup, so I do feel confident we can add a couple insurance runs, as there are two outs for O'Neill Cruz who strikes out swinging. I was really confident that Cruz could be the hero, and it's actually very interesting looking at his season stats because he's putting up nearly identical numbers as he did last year. One player we haven't talked about much though is Dominic Fletcher, who we traded for this season, and maybe it's time we change that because he's going deep into right field and over the fence for a home run. And he's definitely delivered in this video, but the fireworks are not over. Jake Bowers, a moonshot into right center. There's the insurance runs we were looking for as we easily took down our division opponent. We ended up winning three games of that series, so we are 17 games up in the East. Obviously, there is very little chance we miss the playoffs, so I think we're gonna sim most of the next two months. But before we do that, it's time to check out our draft class, and if you laughed at me for drafting a closer at number one overall, who's laughing now? He is an 80 overall with 95 potential with a 95k per nine, so he's gonna be insane. But then after that, we also drafted a 75 overall starting pitcher, along with a 72 overall first baseman. Both of these players could be solid trade bait at 
at the very least. But of course, after that, the rest of our draft really wasn't that good because we did not scout any players. I was gonna say that the closer position has been a huge weakness for us, but surprisingly, our guy actually made the all-star game this season. So even though he's doing really well, it cannot hurt to add another cook to the kitchen. It is time to wrap up a very productive season, but even then, I'm a bit disappointed because we were only one game away from breaking the all-time win record. I have literally never seen this before, but we had all three Cy Young finalists. And if you watch my channel regularly, you know that we've had some pretty good rotations, but I think this is a new level. Honestly, the secret is to go after guys who have very high walks per nine, but checking out our bullpen, it is also very encouraging to see that they cooked, along with our closer, who of course made the all-star game. All things considered, this was also a very good year for our offense, as Jake Bowers truly broke out as one of our best players, and of course, guys like Brent Rooker and O'Neal Cruz did their thing all year. We finished in fourth place for batting average and third for runs, and of course, no surprises here, we were easily in first place for Team ERA. The Tampa Bay Rays are our first playoff opponent, and lucky for us, our Cy Young winner is on the mound, and we already have a runner in scoring position in the second inning, but he's gonna have to hold at third. We really need Blake Burke to come through here, and thankfully the power hitting first baseman delivers, but there's still definitely plenty of time to deliver, especially as Mike Copeland turns on this pitch into left field, which is going to easily turn into a bases clearing double. The rookie catcher just extended our lead, and as we saw in the regular season, we definitely have Tampa Bay's number, except they just tied the game. So it's time for this offense to wake back up, and thank you Brent Rooker, launching this one into left field. That is going all the way back to the wall for an RBI. That was a very good answer, but we definitely still need some insurance runs, as Blake Burke, who got this game started, is trying to help us rally in the bottom of the seventh. Unfortunately though, we stranded Burke at third, and now Tampa ties it up again. So once again, all the pressure is on Brent Rooker, but this time it's too much for him, and he grounds into a double play. There's a very good chance this one goes to extras, but before that can happen, we do have a chance to walk this game off. However, that's not going to be easy, as we're up against flamethrowing closer Andres Munoz, but we do have two guys aboard. We are pinch hitting Dominic Fletcher with two outs, who swung at the first pitch he saw right down the pipe, and this is going to drop in the outfield to give the volunteers a game one walk-off win. What a way to start the playoffs against our division rival, but to be honest, this game should have never come down to the bottom of the ninth. However, game two is not off to a good start, but the volunteers can answer with a man on third and only one out, and Trevor Wood just laid down a beautiful bunt that is going to score a run and get him to first base. There's nothing that gets me going more than a quality bunt, and they just railed Rosario, so there's two men aboard for O'Neal Cruz, and forget about it, that pitch was left right down the middle, and it's going over the fence. Tennessee has a four-run third inning, but the scary thing about this is they may not be done. There is only one away for Blake Burke, who's had a great series so far, and that's going to continue, giving this one a ride into right field, back to the wall, and it is gone. We've seen a lot of offensive struggles in-game, so this is definitely a sigh of relief, as Rasmussen only lasted three innings, but that's not going to stop Tennessee from scoring more runs, because even though we just scored another one to make it 7-1, to O'Neal Cruz is not done, driving in his fourth RBI of the day. After that, Tampa Bay actually managed to rally, but in the end, they could not overcome a seven-run deficit. One more win can move us on to the next round, but there's three runs from Tampa, so I'm definitely going to give them some credit for not giving up, but if they want a chance to come back in the series, they need to stop leaving off-speed stuff over the plate. Regardless, we could not earn the sweep, but I'm definitely not worried yet because we have a very deep rotation, even though they've kind of let us down by giving up big home runs early on in games. The much bigger concern, though, is that our offense has completely disappeared, and that has definitely been a huge reason for our downfall over the past couple games, especially because we have not gotten a single hit through seven innings. We really need that to change, as there's runners at the corners, Wood goes the other way, and what a catch in left field from Randy Arozarena. That was an absolute robbery, but at least a sacrifice fly tied the game at one apiece. But now that we're in the top of the ninth, we need somebody to break up this no-hitter. I honestly don't care if we lose this game as long as we get a hit, especially because this guy is like their fourth best starter, and you've got to be kidding me. All we can do is sim this out, and for some reason, the CPU did not change pitchers, so we just got no hit by the Rays. After having a six-run inning two games ago, this is definitely an all-time low, which of course sets up a winner-takes-all game five. If we blow a 2-0 series lead to Tampa, I know you guys are never going to let me hear the end of it, so it is very important that we take care of business against Shane McClanahan, just like we did last time around, and we've already scored a run. It definitely has not helped that O'Neal Cruz is only hitting 125 in the playoffs, so we're in danger of stranding Ahmed Rosario at third base, but Spencer Steer is going to deliver. Steer definitely had an off year, so it did not cost a lot to trade for him, but if there's one thing he does really well, 
well. It's hitting lefties. As he helps Tennessee get off to a 2-0 start, but there's an answer from Tampa. It would be embarrassing to lose the series with our Cy Young winner on the mound. So just for our pride, we need another rally, but that is a double play. Thankfully though, Tampa did not take advantage, but we still really need to cushion our lead because as we've seen, anything can happen. Rosario did just steal second base. So after a cruise walk, there's two aboard and Brent Rooker's gonna rip this one right up the middle. That will score Rosario from second and give us a two run lead. That was very needed as this is good contact right at Caminero. So we stranded two more runners on base as here's a three run shot and our Cy Young winner surprisingly handed Tampa Bay the lead. We cannot give up, but it feels like all of our contact is going straight at their defenders. So we need Savali to lock in, but that's not gonna happen. We just gave up three more runs in that inning before scoring one of our own. So we are suddenly facing elimination, which is definitely insane because just a few days ago, we were up two to nothing in this series. We have never needed our offense more than we do right now as we have two guys on with zero outs but Brent Rooker just smoked this into left field going back to the wall and this game is tied. Brent Rooker has done it again just like he has throughout the entire playoff series and I wish I could say I'm surprised but he's batting 500 in the series and he's a lefty's worst nightmare. I cannot believe we're now in position to take the lead as Steer's gonna deliver a zero out double and we have a very good scoring chance because Blake Burke has been red hot except Steer's taking off for third base and that was a bad idea. He just got a little bit too greedy, so we wasted the opportunity, and given our success against their lefties, switching to a righty is probably the right move down the stretch. Our all-star closer is gonna give us a walk-off chance, and with O'Neal Cruz up, I like our chances, except that should have been sent to the parking lot. He left that curveball right over the plate, and now we look at strike three, so suddenly it is very likely we're going to extras, as overall, this has been one of the craziest playoff series I've ever seen, as Bowers gives us a drive, but it's not gonna be deep enough. Since we're the home team, we definitely have the advantage, especially after they hit Spencer Steer as this gapper is not gonna drop. There was definitely a moment of excitement there in my voice as I thought that one could get down, but instead we're heading to the 11th where we just retired the side. For the sake of my health, I really need this game to end as Christian Moore's gonna line this down the third baseline and it stays fair for a double. So with zero outs, there's a very good chance this could be it as he advances to third and now we just need a sack fly to win. There are two strikes for Ahmed Rosario and with a full count, we're gonna watch that curveball go outside for a walk. O'Neal Cruz is not who they want to see in this situation. So that is Bradley's second walk in a row, but now Jake Bowers is going to get a pitch right down the middle that he does not pass up. He is already jumping up and down. He knows this one is over. That throw will not even come close and Tennessee barely survives the ALDS. I'm going to need a minute here because that was a brutal playoff series, but still a very fun one. And that's going to set up the ALCS against the Royals. Earlier in the season, we made a huge trade for their backup catcher, Mike Copeland. So I guess you could say this series is gonna decide who won that trade. I have no idea what to expect in game one, but there's two runs. So I'm definitely glad we scored some runs off an 87 overall pitcher, but we may not be done as a passed ball sent Rosario to third base. And now O'Neill Cruz gives us one a drive into deep left center field all the way back to the wall where it is gone. He did not have a great series against Tampa. So that is a big play as our offense has exploded for four runs this inning, but we are not done as this one goes up the middle to score number five. What a statement to open up the ALCS, but Dominic Fletcher is showing us we may not be done as this double clears the bases and we would go on to complete the shutout. It is very clear that we're the better team. So I took a huge risk simulating game two, which we won. And now Dominic Fletcher is going to get our second run on the board of game three. That was a massive RBI triple, but this first inning rally may not be over as there's runners at the corners. And that is unfortunately a double play. Regardless, I'm feeling pretty good about our chances, but Puck just gave up two runs. So it really feels like we could have a shootout on our hands as Trevor Wood scores the go-ahead run, but just like last inning, there's a chance to do more damage, but that is another double play. There is no question we should have a bigger lead, and of course Kansas City tied the game right back up, so it's 3-3. Three to three. And for the third time of the game, we're in danger of leaving runners on base, but Jake Bowers is not gonna let that happen. We finally came through in the clutch, but Christian Moore is showing us that we are not done. Pulling this pitch into left field, that's gonna be an easy double and clear the bases. Now Mike Copeland is looking for revenge against the team that traded him and he smacks an RBI single up the middle as we managed to score seven runs in the first three innings. But Kansas City came back with another two runs so it is definitely not over as Ahmed Rosario loaded the bases with one out which will give O'Neill Cruz a grand slam chance that he definitely just came up short on but that sack fly is gonna score another run. Kansas City never stopped fighting but once again the volunteers proved to be too much for them and they are now facing elimination. Game four is tied in the top of the third at least until Brent Rooker drives in three runs on this 
absolute moonshot, and that definitely silenced this home crowd as now their offense is rolling, and Tennessee is just four innings away from a sweep as here is another bases clearing double. This offense has been so inconsistent throughout the playoffs, so it is definitely beautiful to see them finally figuring it out as they just scored five more runs in the seventh to advance to the World Series in dominant fashion. That was the ALCS, but it looked more like a Little League clinic, but now we get to see who we're taking on in the World Series, and as I foreshadowed earlier, it is none other than the LA Dodgers. It always seems like they're a pretty good bet to make it to the World Series in MLB The Show, and looking at their roster, it is no surprise, as they have one of the best pitching rotations in the league, led by Shohei Otani. We are definitely the underdogs in this one, but if you've learned anything from watching my videos, do not let the overall ratings fool you, because some players play way above their ratings. Our best pitcher is only 83 overall, but we still performed better in the regular season than the Dodgers. And then there's a guy like O'Neill Cruz, who's only an 87 overall, but he put up some monster numbers that were very comparable to 99 overall Mookie Betts. We're up against Shohei Otani to begin the World Series, but so far he's definitely off to a rough start as the bases are loaded and this is going to be a deep sacrifice fly into left center field. Tennessee has struck first in game number one, but unfortunately they're not going to score more, but at least Matt Manning's holding it down and there's a home run for Ahmed Rosario. I never expected Tennessee to play this good as the score is three to one in the top of the ninth, but Tennessee gets the last out in an upset win. Game two has a chance to be a very different story, but O'Neill Cruz wasted no time getting us going with an RBI single, but there are still runners at the corners for Blake Burke, who goes the other way into left field where it's gonna be caught, but that's a sack fly. Our rotation has been incredible, but Tanner Hoke just gave up a run, but Yamamoto responded by loading the bases for O'Neill Cruz, who's able to drop this into left field for another run. This one's looking like a shootout, especially because Yamamoto keeps letting our guys on base, but that was a great play at first. That is gonna keep this at a two-run game, at least until Woods goes yard, and it's crazy to me that our offense broke through Otani and Yamamoto in back-to-back -back games, and the Volunteers start the World Series 2-0. Going up three games against the Dodgers would be nothing short of remarkable, as we've already scored a run, and despite being much lower overalls, our pitching has been way better, but it didn't take long for the Dodgers to tie this one up and then eventually take the lead. This may be the first time of the World Series the Dodgers have held the lead, but it's not gonna last long as O'Neill Cruz drives this deep into opposite field and over the fence. This man is an absolute monster, making that look effortless, so Tennessee is back in the driver's seat, and they have a chance to cushion their lead, but more strikes out looking. Right after that, we did give up three runs, but at least there's still a bit of hope in the ninth inning. We are pinch hitting Brent Rooker, who's come up with some big moments throughout the playoffs, but unfortunately not this time, so Ahmed Rosario could be the last out of this game, but it is not over just yet. These are the moments where heroes are made, and I know it's a lefty-lefty matchup, which is very unfavorable, but I believe in O'Neill Cruz as this is drifting into foul territory on the run and it's caught. Unfortunately, we could not go up 3-0 against the Dodgers and I'm definitely concerned. Momentum shifting against us, but we're up 4 to nothing. and lucky for us, our Cy Young winning pitcher held it down, so we are just one win away from the pennant. By the way, our postseason MVP is Jake Bowers, which is definitely well-deserved because when I signed him in free agency two years ago, I never pictured him having this good of a year, but there's no doubt that this was a breakout season. In every franchise I play, there's always a different breakout star, and this one just happens to be Jake Bowers, who very fittingly just got us on the board with a three-run bomb. I was just talking about him, and now he's gonna hit another home run through simulation, so he's already our playoff MVP, but he's gunning for that World Series title, as we have a five-run lead in the bottom of the ninth, and we just secured out number one. I have played thousands of hours of franchise, yet every single time, I find a different way to have fun, but without a doubt, this college rebuild with the Tennessee Volunteers was one of the most interesting ideas ideas I've ever had, as I took them over with a college roster three years ago, and I brought them to a World Series win in just three seasons. Thank you so much for making it all the way to the end of this video. I really hope you enjoyed, because this was a very different challenge than I've ever seen on YouTube. So if you did make it to the end, please drop a like and subscribe, and also while you're at it, click right here to see more of my content. By the way, Jake Bauer's World Series MVP, let's freaking go.